Having multiple sclerosis is hard enough without having to juggle all of these technical terms. T1, T2, exacerbation, layer meet sign. What does it all mean? I'll explain some basic terminology today. And if you want to skip ahead, you can check out the show notes for some timestamps. And if there's anything I don't cover, please post in the comments below. Let's have some fun. I want to thank everyone on Twitter who gave me suggestions for terms to cover. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Brandon Bieber, and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday. So please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Now we're going to start with some general terms about MS, and we'll start with the concept of a relapse. Now people use these terms in slightly different ways, but for me, the terms relapse, flare, exacerbation, and attack all mean exactly the same thing, which is developing new symptoms due to new inflammation in the central nervous system. And typically these symptoms develop over days to weeks, so relatively quickly, which discriminates this from progression, which we'll talk about next. And the most common symptoms of an attack would be things like pain and vision loss in one eye, or numbness or weakness of part of the body, clumsiness, difficulty walking, double vision, slurred speech, and any other function of the nervous system. And the clinical trials definition of a relapse includes the idea that it must last at least 24 hours, and it must be associated with changes in the neurological exam and not be caused by another stress on the body. So sometimes the older symptoms of MS can come out with a stress on the body, such as heat uh, or illness or fever, and this can cause a sort of recrudescence of symptoms. And this is distinct from a relapse because often there is no new or active inflammation of the body, and the typical treatment would be to treat the underlying cause. So if there's a urinary tract infection, causing this, you would just treat with antibiotics and you would probably get better. Now this sort of worsening due to an external stress is known as a so-called pseudo-exacerbation, different from a true exacerbation. A true exacerbation is treated usually with oral or intravenous steroids. Now progression, on the other hand, is a slow and insidious decline in symptoms over months and years and is often recognized retrospectively. Now the most common symptom of progression would be a decline in walking ability, although some people can experience progression of any symptoms such as cognitive symptoms or clumsiness. For unknown reasons, progressive visual loss is rare. Generally speaking, younger people are more likely to have relapses and older people with MS are more likely to have progression, although some people can have both. Now you probably know that myelin is the fatty sheath that covers the nerve fibers or axons and is the primary target of injury in multiple sclerosis. And there are some associated terms such as demyelination, which is the loss of myelin. And one of the hallmarks of multiple sclerosis is that you often have a lot of injury to myelin with relative sparing of the underlying nerve fibers. And that's why many people with MS can improve after attacks, sometimes very dramatically. There are actually many demyelinating diseases other than multiple sclerosis. Some examples include acute, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Another associated term is remyelination, and that is the regrowth of myelin. And this can actually occur spontaneously in the human body, and there are some drugs that are being developed that could potentially remyelinate injured nerve fibers. One example is clomastine, and I have to separate a video on that if you want to take a look. A common term related to the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis using the procedure spinal tap and lumbar puncture is bands or oligoclonal bands. And this is a finding that's seen in about 90% of people with multiple sclerosis who have a spinal tap. And basically what the bands represent are abnormal antibodies that are present within the central nervous system that are absent in the blood. And the way the test is done is they take the sample from the cerebrospinal fluid and they run it on a gel electrophoresis in an electric current and it shows up as distinct bands and there are several of them. And the term oligo means several. So oligoclonal bands are several bands. And again, that's seen in about 90% of people with multiple sclerosis. So next we'll move to some different symptoms of multiple sclerosis, and the first term is Utoff's phenomenon, which is a temporary worsening of symptoms due to exposure to heat, fever, or exercise. For example, let's say in the past you had an optic nerve injury and you have vision loss in the right eye but recover. You may notice that in a hot bath you may have some recurrence of that symptom where the vision loss comes out again but then goes away as you cool down. This is known as Utoff's phenomenon and I have a separate video on it if you want to take a look. 
Layer meat sign is a symptom that's associated with lesions in the cervical spine and the neck, and it could actually be due to other diseases such as a herniated disc. And it's described as symptoms of which occur with flexion of the neck, and usually it's a tingling or electric shock sensation in the neck, or it could spread down the spine or into the limbs, and there are many variations of it. You may also hear the term multiple sclerosis hug, which is sort of a painful, tight, or cramping sensation in the waist or chest. Sometimes it can be on one side, sometimes it can be on both sides. It can be electric, stinging, sharp, and have different descriptions. And it's essentially a variation of neuropathic pain associated with lesions in the thoracic spine, in the mid-back, and sometimes it's treated with neuropathic pain medications. Now, I'll mention briefly a few of the more common relapses in multiple sclerosis. One is optic neuritis, or inflammation of the optic nerve, and I have a separate video on this if you want to take a look, but basically the typical symptoms would be pain in the eye, especially pain with eye movement and vision loss. Sometimes the pain precedes the vision loss, and the vision loss often preferentially affects the center of the vision and causes what's known as a central scotoma, and often color vision is profoundly affected. But if at its worst the vision is better than 20 out of 200, recovery is usually pretty good. Another common attack in MS is transverse myelitis, which is a little bit of a confusing term, but it just means inflammation that traverses the spinal cord, and it can actually occur on its own unrelated to MS or with other neurological diseases, and it can happen in the neck, and it's called cervical transverse myelitis, or in the mid-back, where it's called thoracic transverse myelitis. And the typical symptoms would be numbness and weakness at and below the level of the lesion. So if you have it here, you could get numbness from the waist down, and sometimes you get weakness, sometimes you don't, and sometimes you can have associated bladder symptoms as well. Now we'll move on to some MRI terminology, and we'll start with the general term lesion, which just means an abnormality on the MRI scan. And typically lesions in MS on conventional MRI are seen in the white matter, which is the part of the brain where the nerve fibers with myelin are. And it's called white matter because if you dissect the brain, it has high fat content and appears white. It turns out in MS there's also injury in the gray matter, but it's very difficult to see on conventional MRI. Now with MRI, you'll hear the term T1 lesions and T2 lesions. And the way MRI works is that you have hydrogen atoms that are disturbed by a radio frequency pulse. And then those hydrogens relax, and they can relax in different ways that are called T1 and T2. And based on the surrounding tissues, these produce different images. Now it's easiest to see multiple sclerosis lesions on T2 sequences where they appear bright. However, sometimes they appear normal on T1 sequences, but sometimes they appear dark. And when they're dark, they're called black holes. And it turns out that when they're black holes, this is associated with more permanent tissue injury and injury to the underlying axons or nerve fibers. This is not to be confused with a 1.5T or 3T MRI, where T refers to Tesla, the strength of the magnet in the MRI. And generally speaking, the stronger the magnet, the higher resolution the image. And 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla MRIs are mostly used clinically, and 7 Tesla MRIs are mostly used for research. Now sometimes with an MRI we'll use contrast dye or gadolinium contrast. And gadolinium is a heavy metal that's injected into the vein through an IV. And the idea is when there's a new active lesion in multiple sclerosis, there's a temporary breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, the normal barrier between the blood and the brain. And it allows the gadolinium to get into the lesion and it causes it to appear very bright, in other words, to enhance. And this can be helpful for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and for monitoring in multiple sclerosis. There's some recent concern because gadolinium can actually accumulate in the brain a little bit over time, especially with linear gadolinium contrast agents. Macrocyclic contrast agents are believed to be safer. Aside from looking at lesions in multiple sclerosis, new quantitative software can actually detect very subtle changes in the volume of the brain in multiple sclerosis and changes over time. And unfortunately, in MS, the brain can shrink or atrophy. Now, this does occur in normal aging at a rate of about 0.2 to 0.4% per year, but in MS, it can be more like 0.5 to 1.35% per year. And it's very difficult to detect by the naked eye, but this very specialized quantitative software can pick it up, especially over time. 
Now I want to mention briefly the different types of medications used in multiple sclerosis and you may hear the term DMT which stands for disease modifying therapy. These are drugs that really don't make you feel any better but they're purely for prevention. Prevention of relapses, prevention of new MRI lesions, prevention of disability and some examples include glutiramer acetate, beta interferon, Tecfidera, Abagio, Gelenia, Tysabri, Ocrevus, Lamchata. These are all disease modifying therapies. They don't necessarily make you feel better but they're supposed to help you in the long run, just like taking aspirin to prevent a heart attack. This has to be distinguished from a symptomatic therapy. This is a treatment trying to help with the symptoms of MS, but not necessarily modifying the overall disease. Some examples would include gabapentin for neuropathic pain, or provigil for fatigue, or Ampira to help with walking. And I have a separate video on Ampira if you want to take a look. Lastly, I want to mention a little terminology related to research, and the first is EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale. And this is a measure of disability in MS used in clinical trials, and also sometimes just by various clinics. And I have a video on this, the scoring is quite complex, but basically it's a 0 to 10 scale, where 0 is no disability, and an EDSS of 2 or 3 could be considered mild disability, 4 could be considered moderate disability, and at EDSS 6, a pain is required to walk 100 meters. The next term is NIDA, or no evidence of disease activity, the ultimate goal in multiple sclerosis treatment. And there are various forms of NIDA, so NIDA 2 would be no relapses and no lesions on MRI that are new or enhancing. NIDA 3 would be no new lesions, no clinical relapses, and no progression of disability. And you can add more and more criteria, for instance, no brain atrophy above normal aging, no increase of serum neurofilament, which is a marker of central nervous injury, and so forth. And this is increasingly a common goal in multiple sclerosis and a common outcome in clinical trials. A term that's become popular just in the last year is PIRA, or progression independent of relapse activity. And unfortunately, even people with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis can sometimes have disability progression that's subtle and unrecognized and not related to a distinct relapse. And this is a troubling concept, but it's important for us to understand, and I do have a separate video on this. It's an important topic for future research as well. Finally, a term you may come across related to basic science research in MS is EAE, or Experimental Autoimmune Encephalitis. And this is a disease that can be do induced in rats and mice, and sometimes other animals, for the purposes of multiple sclerosis research. And that's how we learn a lot of basic information about multiple sclerosis and do early drug trials. So that's all I have in terms of technical terms. If you have any questions about a term I didn't mention or want further clarification, please post in the comments below, and if you have any suggestions for future videos, please also post in the comments below.